Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Online Information Center for the Enterprise Rose Architectural Fellowship for Host Organizations. Um, a little bit of logistical preparation. We'll be taking question and answers at the end of the session through the chat feature, which is on the bottom right of your WebEx screen. So feel free to enter questions at any time throughout the course of the presentation, and then we'll, um, we'll be reading those back for all of our participants to um, answer. And now let me just uh, give me a minute while I bring up our presentation. Okay. So, Ray, would you like to hit us off? Yeah, thanks, Kate. Um, first, just like to thank everyone for joining us today for this uh, live online event. Uh, we're really excited to uh, share with you, uh, potential hosts of Rose Fellows, a little bit more about the program so you can understand um, really why Enterprise Community Partners hosts this uh, really tremendous architectural fellowship program. Um, and then we're gonna have the opportunity to hear from two of our graduating or outgoing Rose Fellows, Jess Blanche and Kaziah Havland, uh, who will give presentations about um, their experiences uh, as a Rose Architectural Fellow and um, how, um, what they think it really takes to be a great host organization and how to mentor these uh, tremendous assets to your organization. Um, and then at the end of the call, uh, we're gonna be going through a little bit more about the application process to make sure everyone's up to speed with the latest and greatest on um, what it means to be a host organization and how to apply for, uh, to become uh, a Rose Architectural Fellowship host. So a little bit about the, um, oh, sorry. We do have a little slight delay in our slides, so bear with me as we go ahead and get started. <laughs> sorry. Great, uh, thanks Kate. So um, I'm Ray Demers, uh, Director of Design Leadership here with Enterprise Community Partners. Um, after me, you're gonna hear from Jess Blanche, an outgoing Rhodes Fellow with Capitol Hill Housing in Seattle, Washington. After that, uh, we're gonna hear from Keziah Havland, a uh, Rhodes Fellow with Thunder Valley CDC in Porcupine, South Dakota. And then Mark Mattel, our Program Director of the Rhodes Fellowship is gonna be giving us, um, rounding out the presentation to uh, let you know about uh, how to apply. Um, so Enterprise is a 35 plus year old um, organization. Um, we really strive to make well-designed homes affordable. Um, we do that by investing in people, programs, and organizations. So what we're really trying to do is to um, really lift all boats by uh, strategically investing in people, programs, and organizations to drive systemic change um, in the United States. Uh, we do that through um, affordable housing, through policy making, through capital solutions, but also through various programs. And one of those programs that we've been running here now for 18, going on 19 years next year, is the Rose Architectural Fellowship. Uh, we often turn back to um, James Rouse, our founder, um, who really from in the nascent stages when Enterprise was still the Enterprise Foundation, understood the importance of design. And we try to take James, word, uh, James Rouse's words to heart uh, because he understood the value of design in, uh, in placemaking. Um, and we really try to leverage that um, vision um, through our Rose Fellowship program. So as I mentioned, we're at 18 years going on 19. Uh, thus far, we've placed 73 fellows in 45 communities with 81 different host organizations. Um, we've developed over 90 community facilities, so that's above and beyond um, the 11,000 plus units of housing um, that we've developed over the years. And you can see the program is um, an extremely dynamic national program. We've had folks everywhere from uh, Boston to Los Angeles, from Porcupine, South Dakota to Seattle, um, down to Austin and um, New Orleans as well. So we're really, um, a growing program uh, with Rose Fellows that have been placed across the country in communities large and small, 
uh, with organizations that uh, really vary in size, scope, um, and um, different uh, areas of focus um, across the nation. And the fellowship mission is, um, you know, here is the official mission, um, and I think that the, the words ring true to us today. But I think what, what the Rose Fellowship is in short is it's, it's a catalyst. It's a, it's a disruption to your organization to try to have, try to achieve massive change. So um, placing a young designer um, with a host organization is one of these moments and it's an inflection point where um, an organization is looking to change business as usual and recognizes design as a key uh, component to that organizational massive change. Um, and it's also an opportunity for an architect or a landscape architect to um, really shift career paths out of a traditional architectural practice towards uh, a social impact model of uh, affecting change. So it's really uh, mission-driven architects and landscape architects with mission-driven organizations, and they get together um, through this fellowship program um, that changes uh, hosts and fellows alike uh, forever. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Jess yeah. to go over um, her experiences with Capitol Hill Housing. Um, Kate is gonna make um, Jess the presenter. Um, and uh, feel free to send chat questions to us uh, on the chat bar on the right-hand side. Kate and I will do our best to facilitate questions there, and then at the end of the session, we'll be sure to answer any of the larger, more macro questions uh, to share with the group. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Sure can. Thanks, Jess. Okay, good. Thanks, Jess. All right. Um, so thanks for having me, and um, I'm just going to start off. Oh, I got to take control. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Um, so, like Ray said, my name is Jess Blanche, and um, I'm finishing up my third year in the Rose Fellowship at Capitol Hill Housing in Seattle. Um, Capitol Hill Housing builds vibrant and engaged communities through affordable housing and community development. Since 1976. We've served low and moderate income residents and have worked to improve this Capitol Hill neighborhood for all. We're a public development authority, which is a place-based quasi-governmental agency and a community development corporation. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can, oh, there we go. Oh no, one back. So while we were founded and are very much rooted on Capitol Hill, we currently own and manage 49 properties all over Seattle, as well as in urban unincorporated King County. We also sponsor the Capitol Hill Eco District, one of the first eco districts in the country. We apply that lens to neighborhood scale sustainability, equity, and livability issues. I came to CHH from a nonprofit community design center where I designed affordable housing and community facilities for nonprofits around Washington State. I was interested in the Rose Fellowship because I wanted to better understand why we make the decisions we make when we design affordable housing and hopefully be able to help influence those decisions earlier in the development process. I also have a background in high performance, super energy efficient buildings. So with its goal of having the greenest portfolio in the Pacific Northwest, the CHH Fellowship work plan offered a great blend of these interests. When I started my fellowship, my work plan was technically split among three departments, assisting with new projects with real estate development, identifying acquisition and redevelopment opportunities with asset management, and working on energy and water efficiency in our existing portfolio, and creating a comprehensive green building strategy with our sustainability team. What this meant is that I needed to touch nearly every department in the organization to figure out how we might meet the big goals of reducing our energy and water use by 20% while also growing our portfolio and making sure our buildings were as green as they could be. No small task. I came to see how siloed the organization was with limited buy-in for CHH's green goals. My role became the connector. So I began with benchmarking our portfolio to see how our buildings were performing and ensuring that we were fulfilling reporting requirements for the city and state. We worked with a consultant to identify the buildings with the lowest hanging fruit for efficiency retrofit and worked some into a multi-building resyndication rehab project that will close next year. 
I trained our property management staff in how to use WeGoWise to track our utilities, and we can now catch utility cost spikes much sooner rather than only maybe catching them if someone happens to notice a bill looks high. While in the design process for Station House, which is the one on the right, a new 110-unit building at the Capitol Hill Light Rail Station, we worked with our contractor and engineers to evaluate the energy performance of our most recent built project, 12th Ave Arts, the one on the left, which was completed in 2014, and apply that understanding to design decisions in Station House, finding the best mix of performance, first cost, and payback to make Station House our best performing building yet, model to perform 26 percent better than code baseline and energy consumption, and 24 percent better than baseline and water. This project is closing as we speak, and construction will be underway any day now. While my work on greening CHH's portfolio initially focused on energy and water efficiency, we've pivoted to focus on resident health through our choices in building materials. It's not that energy and water efficiency aren't important, but due to the complexity of ownership structure and various financial situations for every one of our older buildings, portfolio-wide energy efficiency retrofits are a slow process. And thanks to Seattle's progressive energy and building codes, as well as the Evergreen Sustainable Development Standard, which is Washington State's version of the Enterprise Green Communities criteria, our new buildings are performing relatively well. We're not yet building to passive house or living building standards, but we're making headway. Seattle's construction market is also really ro robust right now, so it's really difficult to do anything extra with limited public subsidy. So in 2016, we partnered with the Healthy Building Network on Home Free, which is HBN's national initiative supporting affordable housing developers to improve human health by using less toxic building materials. We signed the Liberty Bank building on to be the Pacific Northwest demonstration project for Home Free. We learned some crazy things along the way. So there are eight, over 85,000 chemicals listed in the EPA registry, while only 250 have been tested for their impact on humans, only nine have been partially restricted or banned. And not only that, but scientists have found over 200 industrial chemicals in the umbilical cord blood of newborns. That means babies are being born with these chemicals in their systems inherited from their mothers. These chemicals include known carcinogens and dozens more linked to birth defects, obesity, and other diseases. And these chemicals are in all kinds of things, from furniture to food packaging and even building materials. So when people spend up to 90% of their time in buildings and low wealth communities are disproportionately affected by health issues such as asthma, diabetes, and obesity, which are caused or linked to sub toxic substance exposure, healthy, okay, there we go. healthy materials and healthy buildings are a social justice issue. And healthy homes are imperative to our mission to build vibrant and engaged communities. So during the design phase of the Liberty Bank building, the Home Free team evaluated our material specifications, focusing on the high exposure materials in residential units. We learned that we were already doing some things well, again, thanks to the Evergreen Sustainable Development Standard, and that we had a few things to improve. The process didn't guarantee that we would be able to install completely non-toxic materials in our buildings, but we did learn how to take steps in the right direction. We were able to install better countertops and flooring from our original specifications, and we're looking for ways to improve the process in the future. We're taking the lessons learned from Home Free and applying them to both our future developments, as well as renovations and unit turns in our existing buildings with our new Healthy Homes Initiative. I'm currently working on operations and purchasing standards for CHH, as well as partnering, partnering with our resident services team to engage and educate our residents on healthy living, green cleaning, proper waste disposal, and pre pest prevention. Our Healthy Homes Initiative will improve health outcomes for both residents and staff through shifts in practice, as well as education. So over the course of my fellowship, I came to work mainly in the real estate development department, mostly because it's much easier to have one boss but also because CHH's capacity has grown a lot since I started. There's now a staff person in asset management who works on our utility monitoring and resource conservation efforts. The re-syndication rehab with all those energy efficiency retrofits was taken on by other team members. So 
So right now I'm focused on the Healthy Homes Initiative and managing two new projects that are currently both in pre-development. So Jazz House is a partnership with Seattle Jazz Ed, a nonprofit music education program that is committed to serving all children no matter their ability to pay. Currently operating out of a few classrooms in a former school building, Jazz Ed has grown from 50 to over 900 kids in eight years and is prepared to more than double that with their new space that will include performance, instruction, practice, and administrative spaces. Upstairs, there will be 90 homes affordable for households at or below 60% of the area median income, people like artists, teachers, and nurses. In fact, several Jazz Ed instructors have already expressed interest in living at Jazz House. We, are, we just closed on the Jazz House site, which is located in North Rainier Valley in the heart of an established transit corridor and located next door to the future home of two social justice-minded independent schools. The development of this block is really exciting as our four organizations work to improve access to housing, education, and the arts for all Seattleites. The White Center Community Hub will provide 80 affordable homes co-located with social and community services adjacent to park space and schools. In addition, or in partnership with the White Center Community Development Association and Southwest Youth and Family Services, we'll be redeveloping a 2.8 acre site owned by King County. White Center is located just outside of Seattle city limits, somewhat of an island of unincorporated but urban King County. It has for decades been a landing place for immigrants and refugees and is one of the most diverse places in the region but residents are at risk of being displaced as people getting priced out of the housing market in Seattle proper have discovered the lower priced homes and relatively close in location. Southwest Youth and Family Services is already seeing this shift as the populations they serve are moving farther and farther south. This new facility will allow them to be closer to clients and will also give the White Center CDA a space to expand their services to the community as well. So both of these projects are partnerships with other community-based organizations, as are nearly all of the projects in our pipeline right now. Partnerships are something CHH has moved toward with intention over the last few years. And as we develop farther away from our home neighborhood, we want to ensure communities are part of the conversation, that development is happening with them, not to them. One of the ways we do that is to work with organizations rooted in these communities to help build trust and ownership. This is just as crucial as resource efficiency and healthy materials as we work to prevent displacement and improve the health and equity in our community. That's it, thanks. Thanks, Jess, Thank really, you, really Jess. appreciate it. Um, folks can uh, write questions for Jess uh, in the chat box. We'll be sure to facilitate those towards the end of the call. We're gonna turn it over to Kaziah now. Hi everyone, just waiting to, to get control of the, the screen. Um, Sorry, because I let you start and I'll, I'll get you to the next slide in a second. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Um, okay, so my name is Kazaya Haviland and I'm the Director of Design and Planning at Thunder Valley CDC, which is located in Porcupine, South Dakota. Um, I came to this fellowship from Austin, Texas, uh, where I was working in community engagement, um, creative placemaking, uh, kind of citywide uh, public art initiatives, and residential architecture. Um, I was really interested in the Rose Fellowship for a number of years, uh, but didn't really feel like I was prepared enough to apply, and, and wanted to wait until I, you know, came across the, the really perfect fellowship um, that would match my, my skill set, uh, where I would really be able to contribute something in my eyes. Um, and so uh, when I, I heard Thunder Valley's uh, pitch on the webinar three years ago, um, it just felt like the right fit for me, and I was lucky enough to be awarded the fellowship. So um, as I mentioned, Thunder Valley CDC is uh, located on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Uh, oops, <laughs> went a little too far. Um, Sorry, it's a little bit slow. Okay, so it's located on the Pine Ridge, Ridge Reservation in southwest South Dakota. Um, it's an incredibly rural location uh, that was intentionally cut off from the rest of the state by the Badlands uh, to the north, uh, east, and west, and the Sandhills to the south. Um, 
So Pine Ridge is really famous uh, for two two reasons, uh, neither of which are, are really great reasons to be known for. Um, one of which was the massacre at Wounded Knee, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. Um, and the other is just uh, really extreme poverty. Um, so when people talk about Pine Ridge, these are the usual statistics that they hear uh, or that they speak about. You know, the life expectancy that's 48 for men and 50 for women, high rates of unemployment, obesity, diabetes, um, a shortage of 4,000 homes uh, projected by the um, housing authority here, which doesn't seem like a lot when you consider the population is between 35,000 and 40,000. It's, it's really a huge number. Um, these statistics are often accompanied uh, by what we at Thunder Valley call the poverty porn photos. Um, and, you know, those are photos of the junked out cars or, you know, a kid with no shoes and dirt on their face. Um, they're the things that are really meant to evoke certain emotions. Uh, and the people that are seeing them. Um, but I actually choose not to show those photos because that is not what greeted me uh, when I started my fellowship. Um, what greeted me uh, was a really vibrant uh, and resilient community, uh, an incredible culture uh, with beautiful art uh, and a really strong and you know, enduring people. Um, and I think that outsiders visiting the reservation often miss this. You know, they're, they're blinded by a, a, a broken down trailer or some, uh, some scene that they kind of see as, as sad in their eyes. And they, they miss these really beautiful moments that are experienced here and the beautiful culture uh, that is experienced here. Um, and so a lot of outsiders come to the reservation wanting to sort of you know, fix the problems that they see here. Um, and often those fixes are very temporary and do not have a long lasting or systemic effect. And so Thunder Valley CDC um, realized this. And about 10 years ago, a group of uh, Lakota people got together and said, you know, if we're gonna make lasting change on this reservation, it really has to come from within. Um, and so they spent gosh, I guess about seven years um, doing community engagement um, and asking, you know, their, their family and their friends and other community members, uh, you know, what does a healthy community look like? What does a safe community look like? What amenities are we missing in our community? You know, what do we need to do to provide the opportunity for our people to lift themselves up? Um, and what Thunder Valley expected to get back as an answer was, we need houses uh, because there's such an intense shortage of housing and housing is related to so many um, other issues, uh, you know, with, well, <laughs> it's a whole other conversation, but um, they, they really expect it to be concentrated on homes, but that wasn't actually the answer they got at all. Um, you can see some of the typical answers that they would receive was uh, talking about spiritual wellness, uh, emotional health, um, access to grocery stores and childcare, sustainable systems, um, collaboration, self-determination. Um, so, you know, they realized uh, that, you know, community isn't isn't created by building homes, um, but it's really built by providing opportunity for people and, and families and relationships to grow. Uh, the buildings are really just the shelves um, that, that house all of this uh, personal and uh, community work. Um, they're the, the physical representation of that change. Um, so Thunder Valley reevaluated and <laughs> they created nine program areas. Um, community design uh, is, just, is just one of those many areas. Um, and so they do things like with housing and home ownership, they'll help people work on their credit or learn how to make monthly budgets and weekly budgets so that once they get into a house, they know how to, to keep that house. Um, Lakota language, we actually have, we offer Lakota language classes um, for adults, but we also have a, a child care immersion uh, daycare center where little babies are learning to speak Lakota um, as a first language uh, so that the language doesn't die out. Food sovereignty, you know, we live in a, an intense food desert here, um, but the one thing that we have uh, no lack of is land. So um, how do we take this land and cultivate this land and build internal food systems uh, to better the health of the people who are living here? Um, so it became these nine areas uh, and these programs are, are not at all uh, siloed. All of them often work together on, on various projects, realizing that they're going to have a lot stronger and a lot more effective results uh, when you combine different ways of thinking. Um, 
And so we took all of this information um, and worked with a planner and a designer to come up with this uh, community plan, which is a 34-acre development, um, which is, is no small thing. Um, so, you know, it's not something that can be built within a year. Uh, it, it takes several years to build something this large. And so when I arrived was sort of right after this plan was created. Um, and so my first job with Thunder Valley CDC was to go back to the community and say, okay, you've given us this big long list of things and amenities that you want in your community. Um, and, you know, we have this plan that we've created, uh, you know, with you. Um, you know, there were several iterations of what that plan looked like. Um, but now we have to match up the program to the plan. Um, and so we talked about what the most immediate needs were and the order of construction and the, the process. Um, and so, you know, we asked um, the second graders what they want their playground to look like. And we asked kids at the skate park, uh, you know, what's missing at this existing skate park that would make a skate park on the other side of the reservation better? Um, you know, and so they talked about, well, we need a, a bathroom. We need a place to pee. <laughs> and uh, they said, don't put it next to, you know, right next to a basketball court because then basketballs get thrown in and it starts fights. And so um, really learning from these little tiny details that the community members had to offer to us uh, to really lay this out in the most logical way possible. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, it, it, I can't exactly do all of this work and we can't do all of this work in such a short period of time. So um, realize my focus is really going to be phase one of this development and that was going to include 21 single family homes, uh, 12 unit apartment building, uh, 50,000 square feet of commercial and office uh, space, so daycare, EMS, um, public parks and playgrounds, and uh, community center. Um, so we sort of had an idea of, of what I was going to tackle on a grand scale, um, and it was really, you know, soup, soup to nuts, uh, so everything from project management to funding um, to engagement uh, to a little bit of design as well. Um, but when we jumped into actually creating these buildings, uh, we knew it wasn't really something I was going to be able to tackle on my own. Um, because, you know, I, I'm not from the area, I'm a, a community outsider. Um, and so trying to figure out, well, now we're going to build these buildings, what, what does a modern Lakota architecture look like? Uh, you know, we don't just want to build a, a whole bunch of teepees. Um, so how do we create, you know, a modern form of that? Uh, we brought on a group of advisors. Uh, it was an artist advisory committee uh, that I was lucky enough to work with uh, who were really able to talk about um, uh, cultural aspects, spiritual aspects, how buildings would be used, um, different practices, different ceremonies, the importance of different materials or uh, orientations. Um, and so I was lucky enough to, to work with them um, to start narrowing down, you know, what do some of these buildings actually physically look like now that we're, we're about to start designing and building them. Um, and I guess the best uh, example, that, oops, Trying to get to the next slide. The best example that I have of this uh, is our community center. Um, oh, sorry, I don't know why it's not not advancing. Um, what two slides? Yeah, <laughs> try and get it back one, um, but. Kate, do you think you can go, yeah, yeah to that, oh, <laughs> one more yeah, down. I have it now, sorry, I'll give it back to you. So. <laughs> so if you go to the, yeah, the next slide, um, we worked with our architects and the advisory committee and the community for a really long time kind of stuffing out exactly what the plan of this building was going to look like. Um, and we were super happy with it. And in fact, our plan has basically not changed from the design development stage because we've put so much work into it. Um, but then about a month after we sort of finished talking about the plans, uh, they sent us this rendering at the top left here with this yellow building. Um, and while it's a, a perfectly fine building, um, when we got it back, we saw it and, and everyone was just immediately like, you know, no, this is not us. You know, this is not, um, not, what our culture looks like. Uh, they said this is a longhouse. You know, we were Lakota. We did TP. Um, so uh, we 
we ended up taking this image that they sent us and I put it into Photoshop and just you know, did a whole bunch of iterations of it, different roof lines, different materials. Um, and then we had a community meeting and passed out a bunch of, of these images and just asked people to comment on them and say, what do you like? What don't you like? Um, you know, tell us what looks Lakota to you. And when we got the sheets back, uh, every single person who was at that meeting, it was like 30, 35, 30, 35 people who were there, all picked the same exact image to say, this is the right one. Um, and that really struck me because I have never been to a community meeting ever where every single person there agreed. Um, so um, it was it was pretty impressive. And so we sat down and said, okay, well, you know, why? And we asked the community, we asked the artist, why is it that this specific one works? And, and the version of it was uh, a butterfly roof. Um, and, you know, the comments back were that, oh, well, you know, if you have this butterfly butterfly roof, which you see in these bottom two slides, um, you can have these clear story windows that connect uh, the, in, the person inside to the sky. And having that connection to the sky is super, super important in Lakota culture. If you look back at all of the traditional buildings, whether it's the teepee uh, or a powwow ground uh, or just a shade structure, um, there's that, that connection to the sky. And said, so, oh, okay, that's, that's great. You know, so what else? You know, what are these other traditional elements of building um, that we could potentially uh, incorporate in modern buildings? And said, oh, well, you know, you can always see how it's put together. Okay, yeah, so the, the TP, it's a really tectonic form, the MEP. When you go inside, you see how all the pieces of wood are coming together. Um, so we need, to, we need to expose our structure in our building and show them, you know, with this wood structure, how it's being held up. Um, another person talked about you, you still find these stone teepee rings um, in the Badlands. And so we said, okay, yeah, let's put stone, stone at the base and make sure that we orient it to the east because uh, all of teepees were usually oriented to the east to greet the morning sun. Um, so there are all of these aspects that we began talking about as a, as a community um, and we brought back this long list to our, our uh, architects and I had the pleasure of asking them to, to do a big redesign. Um, and so, you know, it, it took a little while and after a few weeks, they came back with this middle version you see here um, and everyone saw it and they're like, you know, yes, this is it. This is us. This is, this is what um, we want this building to look like. This is a modern Lakota architecture. Um, and unfortunately due to value engineering, uh, we had to scale that back down a bit, but um, we did that again with the community and with the artists saying, you know, what can we do um, to sort of uh, keep some of these important elements while bringing down the cost? And so we eliminated the windows on the east and west side, but just kept them on the big community spaces, which unfortunately you can't see in this rendering, but they're on the, the other end. Um, and replaced the others with cedar, which is an important material. Um, and, you know, we kept the east-west entry and the stone. We uh, tightened up a little bit of the glass, uh, but we kept the exposed wood structure on the interior. So, you know, we really wanted to keep a lot of those main elements, but um, the actual form of it changed a little bit. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, um, it's just uh, an image of, of where we are today with construction. And then to the right of it, there is our 12-unit uh, apartment building where we went through a very similar process, both in the plans of the individual apartments and the actual building itself. Um, and so that really helped establish a design process for Thunder Valley with these being our, our first buildings. Um, we now know how we're going to approach that design. Um, and I think my, my next job as my fellowship starts to wind down um, is to actually create a set of design guidelines that specify exactly how we want to approach projects. Everything from community engagement uh, to, um, you know, inclusion of culture um, to materiality uh, and durability and sustainability goals. Uh, so uh, that, that will sort of be the way that um, I'll get to, to wind my fellowship uh, up and, and sort of create one final package that can be used in the future and certainly adapted um, as time moves on. So um, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, I think I was, I was really lucky. I had an incredible relationship uh, with my host organization. Uh, and uh, I think this is due to a few things um, that I, I just wanted to list out uh, as, you know, prospective hosts. I think these things are really important to me. Uh, and one was uh, trust and a sense of teamwork. Um, so 
on my part, being really honest with them about my abilities, but also working hard, getting out of my comfort zone all of the time. Um, you know, Google was my best friend, um, learning how to learning how to do new things uh, and really take on anything that they needed. Um, but also saying, you know, if I can't do something, um, I need help, you know, where can we get that help? And whether it was TA from an outside organization or a few of us pulling an all-nighter trying to figure out how to write our first performa for the development, um, which which was a, a fun thing that happened, I guess, about my third week into the fellowship. Um, you know, it, it was great to know that there was a group of people um, who were ready to work with me and who trusted my abilities. Um, and other was communication. I had a weekly check-in uh, with my executive director. Um, and during that check-in, you know, they didn't have time as executive director to be involved in every single decision that was happening with the development, but I would just come in with a long list of decisions that had to be made and pros and cons um, and a bunch of things that they would have to sign. Uh, and so it really kind of helped them cut down the amount of time they had to spend because I was able to develop really a concise package that we just went through uh, every week. Um, another one is support. Um, I've had two executive directors while I've been here. Uh, and, you know, after I earned their trust, um, they, they have my back no matter what, whether it was um, a situation uh, with the tribe where I needed somebody who was a tribal member uh, to really speak for me or at a community engagement session or, you know, working with the USDA and we needed to sort of figure out how to make something work. Um, they were, whenever I asked, something of them, they did their best to help me out. Uh, and that was really important to feel that support and encouragement. Um, almost finished, sorry. <laughs> Another is just working toward the same end goal. So really having the same sense of purpose and, and wanting the same thing out of the fellowship. Um, and so uh, sticking on mission uh, and really creating realistic expectations for what can happen. You know, when I first came in, my, my work plan was actually, it was impossible. <laughs> it was impossible to finish just on the timeline alone for how much construction they were hoping to do in a short period of time. And so about three months in, we had to sit down and, and uh, sort of reevaluate and create more realistic expectations and goals so that um, we were actually really accomplishing things instead of constantly feeling like we weren't doing enough. Um, and then I think finally a really important one is just the appreciation and application of the fellow skill set. Um, I think that, you know, we, we tried to, to do this with Thunder Valley, um, but there's just so much going on and so much that needed to happen that I couldn't really focus in uh, entirely on what my skill set was because I had to also do things like work on performas and work on funding applications, um, which I had, had never done before. Um, we had a great moment about a year and a half ago where, uh, you know, my boss was talking about architecture and they looked at me and they're like, wait, so you could design a building? And I said, yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm an architect. That's actually what, what I do. Um, and so um, it was uh, just kind of a funny moment of recognition of like, oh my gosh, you know, I completely forgot that this is what your skill set is um, because we've needed you to do all these other things. So I, mean, I think it was important that I was willing to do all those other things because they needed to happen and I was probably the most qualified to be doing them. Um, but it would have been nice to be able to kind of work within my skill set of, of creative place thinking and engagement um, and design and push that a little bit further. Um, but in general, I, uh, I think we had an incredible relationship and I think really the, the key was communication and expectations. So. Uh, I think that's that's everything. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Kazai. That was tremendous. I think both you and Jess really explained um, a lot about uh, what what you came there for and sort of how you engaged. And uh, you know, I'm noting words like connector, mission oriented, partnerships, consensus, engagement, um, uh, perseverance, and follow through. I think those are all strong trends that carried through both of your presentations, so thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Mark Mattel now, uh, Program Director with the Rose Fellowship, to explain a little bit more about um, how Enterprise thinks about the Rose Fellowship, uh, the structure of the program, and uh, a little bit more about the application and timeline uh, coming down. 
We've been on mute the whole time. No, 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 we haven't. Oh, okay. I just muted. Oh, that's good. Thanks, Kate. Uh, going to turn it over to Mark here. Want to remind folks, uh, the chat box is open on the right-hand side of your screen in the panel, so feel free to ask questions there. Uh, we'll be fielding them after Mark runs through um, some content. Okay, thanks. Mark, go ahead. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm hoping everyone can uh, hear me. Um, I just want to reiterate some of the words that uh, Ray mentioned and to, to thank both Kaziah and Jess for really articulating their experiences over the last three years. Uh, just want to touch on, on one word here that uh, Kaziah mentioned, which is relationships. Um, it's, a, it's a key part of the fellowship that there's an open line of communication and both a, a trust in, in the work that we do. Um, you're hearing from both Jess and Kaziah, but, uh, you know, but during this presentation, for time's sake, you're not able to hear from uh, the Capitol Hill team and the Southern Valley team, but it's definitely a three-part uh, uh, stool where we have a relationship with you, the host organization, um, through our fellows who are the boots on the ground and helping you innovate in uh, the specific location that you're in. And at Enterprise, we really work towards uh, bridging, becoming that conduit and that bridge to, to help sort of articulate the work plan that you create for the fellow and make sure that we are all on the, the same page, that we're moving towards uh, a similar end goal so that we can create an environment for your host and organization to innovate and then the fellow can help uh, sort of achieve that over the course of the two years. So you know, next slide really quick, Kate. Um, so, you know, during the Rose Fellowship journey, as you can, as you saw in both Jess and uh, Kaziah's presentation, that there's an evolution uh, about acclimating to the environment when first placed. Uh, you know, for, for the fellows, uh, this is a, a foreign context to them in, in the sense that there is not a traditional architecture practice where we uh, are sort of designing uh, collaboratively in um, an office uh, where, you know, entering into your world, uh, the CDC world, where uh, we sort of have to be uh, flexible and adjust to circumstances that uh, need to make the project move forward, such as uh, funding, uh, uh, such as meeting with the city, uh, the zoning uh, committee. And so there are a lot of uh, components that, that you deal with that the fellows may not be familiar with in, you know, outside of the architecture profession. So there's a, there's a level of exploration, but that in immersion stage after acclimating uh, to the context uh, is really when the fellow starts to understand and starts to get a bit, a better picture of what can happen uh, in the organization, how you can innovate. And then that last part is really when you start seeing the fruits of the work as you can, as you saw from, uh, Jess's piece after they were able to, you know, select materials that were um, healthy and could, could sort of improve the lives of the tenants of Capitol Hill and also in the built context of uh, Thunder Valley where Kaziah was able to sort of implement the housing apartment complex and community center. Um, let's move to the next slide. So this is more of the logistical part of the fellowship. Um, you know, you know, once we've selected you as a host, there's a, a long, rigorous interview process, uh, but after you've selected the fellow, we sort of um, accommodate the moving cost uh, for that fellow to move to said location. Um, and part of the fellowship throughout the two years is uh, that ongoing communication and support from enterprise where we sort of exchange tools, where we're reporting on a quarterly basis, uh, we're having conversations, uh, through methods of a conference such as uh, HDLI or the Rose Fellowship Retreats. And this is a time uh, where actually fellows and host organizations retreat together so that we can sort of challenge ourselves and look and reflect back on the work that we're doing and figuring out what's working and then sort of adjusting to the, the hurdles that we need to uh, jump to accomplish our project. Um, so in here, you can read very quickly some of the components that, that happened throughout the year with uh, two, two retreats, one in the spring, one in the fall, and then reporting uh, at the very uh, the, the quarter periods. And we do uh, maintain a relationship with the hosts uh, at the end of the year to make sure that we're all on the same page and are tracking uh, based on the work plan that's um, aligned in the application process. If you can move on to the next slide, please. Um, so, just so you're curious about what sort of transpires post-fellowship, um, 
you know, we have a lot of our um, fellows actually become licensed architects, sometimes prior to the fellowship and, and, and at, at most some during the fellowship. Uh, most of us are very sustainably driven and look for uh, professional certifications such as, as LEED or Earthcraft if you're in a specific region of the country. Uh, are, are some certifications that our fellows really pursue to help better the context and the work of uh, the host organization. Um, a lot of our alumni, you know, after doing the fellowship end up staying in, in the community development world. As Ray mentioned, this is really an opportunity for emerging architects to be able to step out of the traditional practice realm and enter the CDC world to help affect um, the built environment of the folks that you guys are helping. Um, the majority, and you know, afterwards, a lot of our fellows actually stay with the host organization uh, post fellowship uh, to so sometimes to complete their work and to make sure our project sees its fruition all the way through. Um, a lot of our fellows end up taking leadership roles based on the relationship with the host because you have a pivotal role in helping shape uh, the career trajectory of uh, a young individual uh, in your organization, and they end up helping lead some of the conversations that you are very much interested in, your, in at your host. Um, and about 50% of us stay in the community. It's, it's a pivotal part of our work, um, you know, for both uh, Jess and Kaziah, you know, they uh, sort of expressed interest in continuing to work post uh, fellowship in their respective locations. Uh, next. And again, this is just to reiterate that uh, the last statistic uh, that you saw on the bottom of the page is that this partnership uh, that we've seen after 18 years really is uh, a marriage between um, the design profession and the host organization. We've really seen fellows really commit to the work based on the environment that's provided at the host organization. And you as the applicant, uh, host applicants really have a pivotal role in, in crafting what that environment looks like. And um, as you can see from both Jess and Kaziah's end results, um, that isn't uh, just a body of work that they created. That is uh, an exchange of work that's happened between uh, the, between their fellowship and the team that's at, at your organization. So, you know, we're looking forward to, you know, uh, reading and reviewing your applications um, and hope that uh, we can answer any questions up until November 9th so, so to clarify any uh, context or questions you may have regarding the application process for hosting a fellow. So uh, I just wanted to wrap that up very quickly. Uh, um, I may have missed some things, but I think, um, oh yeah, let me go into the timeline. I'm sorry about that. Um, so right now we're on that second uh, uh, tab, uh, October 22nd, which is the uh, webinar. As I mentioned earlier, November 9th is the post application deadline. Um, we're spending the month of December really evaluating all of your applications and, you know, making sure that we are crafting a, a great work plan for the fellow to um, enter and also to make sure that we're meeting the needs of uh, what you specify in the work plan. And then in the early part of the following year, we'll have selected the host and then we start the review process for selecting your fellow. Uh, this runs uh, until um, July where it's sort of uh, um, a process for uh, allowing all of you to sort of speak about your work and sort of leverage your host organization to attract fellows uh, with the deadline for the application in April and, and May. And we spend the month of June and July really teasing out that process of selecting the fellow and making sure that there's a right fit for your organization um, to help uh, sort of usher your work in the next two years. So again, um, my apologies. Uh, if, if I missed anything, uh, feel free to ask in the Q&A and also during the uh, question and answer uh, session that's next. So thanks, Ray. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Mark. Really helpful. Appreciate uh, walking through the timeline. I'm sure we had a lot of folks uh, with questions about that. Um, one quick note, and then I'm going to ask Kate if we have any questions. Um, if you're interested in um, hosting a Rose Fellow or applying to host a Rose Fellow, um, you can go to our website, uh, search Rose Fellowship online. Uh, we can also follow up with an email to everyone uh, with that as well. And uh, on that, there's a uh, Meet the Fellows page, and then there's a uh, Become a Host link. Uh, that's where you signed up for this webinar. 
If you go to that uh, Become a Host link, uh, you'll see all the application information and specifics about organizational info, uh, what you need to apply, what we're going to need to see, and then you'll have access to the application online. Uh, Kate, what do, do we have any questions? We do. Thank you. Um, the first one is how large, you know, specifically like number of staff on average have host organizations been in the past? Ray, do you maybe want to start? Yeah, off? sure. That's a good question. Um, it really ranges. We've seen um, really small organizations of uh, two to five folks, uh, you know, organizations where there's a couple folks wearing a lot of hats. Uh, we've also seen the much larger, um, you know, 30, 40, 50 person organizations uh, where you have a bit more specialized um, uh, folks. And you'll see, I mean, you even saw that in the presentations today from, from Jess and Kazaya. Jess's uh, Capitol Hill housing is not huge, but they're, they have departments and they have really clear um, areas of focus for different staff there. Uh, you know, Kazaya had a much smaller uh, shop at Thunder Valley. Uh, and, you know, much fewer folks wearing a lot of different hats. So um, it can run a few different ways. Um, we are, by way of what we're looking for in a host organization, I think size of, of host is not as important as um, the ability to mentor and uh, work with a professional, a design professional in this case, uh, and the interest and desire to really leverage design for um, the good of your body of work. I think those are the two key things. It's less about the size of the org um, and more about um, the drive uh, to use design as a lever. Um, I have a sort of related question, which is, do you have to be an official CDC or other nonprofit organizations eligible to host fellows? Uh, it's a good question. Most, most host organizations, I beg your pardon, um, all host organizations are 501c3s. We do sometimes see uh, partnerships happen between um, a couple different organizations, a CDC and a for-profit developer or um, some sort of joint uh, possibility. That's also uh, possible as well. We also have seen um, several housing authorities uh, be really strong hosts for Rose Fellows, um, and so that, that happens as well. Um, but we can see a lot of different things, but 501c3 status is, is part of it, yep. Great, so then this is another, uh, sort of changing the subject now about the fellow relationship with the host organization. What are the expectations for FaceTime between the fellow and executive director in terms of guidance, mentorship, and professional development? Uh, like what does supervision look like um, for fellows and how much time is, spent working independently for those fellows. Yeah. Um, I'll take a quick one sentence, but I'll, I think I'll turn it over to uh, Mark uh, for his feedback and then maybe over to Jess and Kazaya to see if they have insights as well. Uh, feel free to duck. But, um, you know, I think we don't have any clear um, expectation or standard set around executive leadership and a Rose Fellow meeting, you know, weekly, biweekly, monthly, anything like that. Um, what is important is that the, the fellow has the support, uh, guidance, uh, buy-in, and um, sanction isn't quite the right word, and neither is, you know, they have the sort of um, ability to lead this body of work and participate in this body of work through the organization. So um, it's about partnership, you know, Jess, Jess mentioned the, um, you know, a need to have um, a boss, uh, one boss or a couple bosses that you're working with to really drive the process. And then uh, visibility to and with the executive leadership is really helpful. Um, there are not requirements set up around that, though. Mark, I wonder if you have thoughts outside of that, too? Yeah, and I think that was a really long one sentence, right? Um, but um, one of the thoughts that uh, I'd like to share with all of you is really to, to cultivate that relationship in the very beginning. Uh, we certainly uh, have seen fellows thrown into the fire during a, a project or um, sort of a community engagement piece, but we've seen a lot of success uh, when there is a little bit of, um, not hand-holding, but uh, uh, guidance in the er early parts of the fellowship to help uh, the fellows acclimate to how things are done at your organization. Uh, when there's a level of understanding that happens quickly, um, that's when really the innovation happens because the, the fellow sort of does it, sort of understands the culture 
of your organization and how things are done and can sort of see the pinch points and the hinge points uh, and, you know, maybe what levers to push and maybe who to speak within your organizations very early on. And so that, you know, that relationship can start to taper back as the fellowship grows. Um, as you can see, both in Paziah and Jess's presentation, they were working at different scales at the very beginning of their fellowships uh, in sort of incremental roles. But as, as uh, the fellowship grows within the, the second year, in this case, or year and a half, um, you're, you're starting to see uh, a level of autonomy within the organization and the, the fellows is sort of able to navigate that process uh, and sort of usher in the work uh, through the work plan. So, Mark, a, a sort of related question is, could you maybe be more specific about the actual requirements for the supervisor? Specifically, does it have to be an in-house architect? Oh, no, no, that is, that is not the case. Uh, so we, we require that, uh, that there's a direct supervisor, but they do not have to be an architect. We've seen in the past that they've become uh, sort of at times the real estate director. Uh, we've seen uh, sort of the community engagement director uh, directly supervise the fellow, and we've seen at some scale the executive director uh, or sort of has that direct relationship with the with the fellow um the just to clarify the architect is sort of serves as a as, as a mentor or a, a sort of a guide piece that uh sometimes is a partner within the host uh, maybe that's related to a project but it's not a specific requirement to have that component in your organization uh, we certainly don't expect that uh, understanding from the context of which you guys are working in that having an in-house architect is not something we we see that often it's just I think it, it adds a level of uh, interest in, in, into the work plan, but it's not something that's required. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, now, these questions are probably uh, more directed at Ray, but um, there's a few here that are just um, host organizations, potential host organizations trying to understand what are the anticipated financial obligations that they would have over the course of the fellowship. Um, you know, some make sure you touch on sort of the employment by the CDC benefits and. Yeah, no, that's a good question. We have one minute left, so I'm going to try to do this quickly. Mark was right. I had a run on sentence before. Um, so uh, the, the, when the Rose Fellow comes on to your organization, if you're um, selected, uh, they do come on to your staff and your payroll. So uh, they will be paid through your organization. Enterprise will give a grant to the host organization to sponsor that Rose Fellow. And then we, um, incur costs quarterly. Um, the ideal setup for the Rose Fellowship is that Enterprise will cover a site, uh, the uh, one year and then the host organization will cover uh, one year, which okay. gets us of the salary, which gets us to two years. Um, and then there are costs for administration, travel, um, some of the um, professional development, um, trainings, those sorts of things, which, which roll up into it. Um, and when, when host organizations are selected, we'll work with them to say, okay, this is the resources we have available, this is what we need to fundraise for, and we either partner with the host organizations or fundraise separately to make sure that we can uh, cover the cost of, of the full two-year fellowship. So we really do that hand in glove, hand in hand, however you like, uh, between enterprise and the host organization uh, for the duration of the fellowship. Great. David? Thanks, Ray. That's, um, that's all the questions we have. Great. Um, okay. Well, first I want to thank Kaziah and Jess for uh, helping us out. I think it's really important to hear about the impact that the fellows have so host organizations or prospective host organizations can understand um, what they're applying for. Um, they certainly tell the stories much better uh, than I could. Um, and I want to thank Mark and Kate and our team here in Boston for their help. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to send an email to the Rose Fellowship mailbox. You can also find our email addresses on the Enterprise website. We're happy to answer questions, and uh, we look forward to reviewing your applications. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.